I am happy to introduce you with Rasmus Kleis Nielsen. Rasmus is the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. He is also a professor of political communication at the University of Oxford. And maybe some of you who are now watching this, pro this conference uh, joined us also before uh, earlier in the morning when we were talking about both media um, financials during last year. So what Rasmus actually is doing, it's much, much broader uh, analysis of how media have uh, survived and dealt in this last year in a broader perspective. So I'm really very interested looking forward. And Rasmus, please, 10 minutes yours. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be part of this. Um, I want to speak uh, in broad terms to where we are with the business of news from the headline of the business that we want for the future and not lingering on the business uh, that we had in the past. And really what I wanted to start with um, is this um, observation. The truth is hard. I think many of you will recognize it because of course in this particular font it's um, part of the New York Times advertising campaign that I think rightly recognize that while the truth is hard, living without it is harder because we are likely as citizens, but perhaps also as journalists and as news media to make mistakes if we misunderstand the world in which we live and confuse our assumptions, uh, ideals or aspirations with reality if they are not always borne out by reality. And in that sense, uh, what I want to do today is very quickly to paint a sort of a picture of where I think we are uh, with the business of news and where I think we are heading, not because it's easy, but because it's better to know where we are if we want to chart a course forward, which as um, Victoria so rightly said in her opening, is critical for journalism, for the news media, and more broadly for the societies that they serve. So where are we? Well. We're in the middle, I think, of an unfinished media revolution where everyone everywhere with access uh, seem generally to prefer digital, mobile, and platform media to print uh, and broadcast. That's important for journalism because news was already a small part of media use offline, often estimated as sort of 10 to 15% of the time that people spent with media and thus uh, a relatively small part of the overall media economy. But in the online environment, it's an even smaller part. Uh, of media use, just three to 5%, depending on the measurements and uh, variation from country to country across digital, mobile, um, and platform media. Now, the reason I say this is an unfinished media revolution uh, is in part about technology, but it's also about generational replacement. We need to keep in mind that much of the current media environment is still carried by the media habits and preferences of generations that grew up with broadcast television and in some cases print media and still consume them even though they also use digital media. But every day when someone dies, it's someone who uses TV and print. And every day when someone comes of age, it's someone who has grown up in a digital mobile and platform dominated environment. So even if all the geeks in Silicon Valley and in China and elsewhere stopped innovating and stopped developing new technologies this moment, we would still have a generation replacement driving a further move towards digital, mobile and platform dominated media. This is not stopping uh, or slowing down in the slightest. What does that mean? Well, it means that the offline revenues that have been subsidizing online journalism are coming to an end. Um, the World Association of News Media a few years ago estimated that about 90% of newspaper revenues globally still come from print. And of course, broadcasters are heavily reliant on offline revenues as well. Um, and even after more than 20 years, many newspapers, digital operations are not profitable, just as many commercial broadcasters are not even trying to make a profit from digital news. This cannot go on indefinitely. The offline revenues and profits will cease. They are in structural decline. And we have to make online journalism sustainable on its own terms if we wanted to have a future. What does that mean in terms of where we are heading? Well, I mean, most fundamentally, it means that journalism faces a massively intensified com for, uh, competition for attention enabled by technology. Um, this is a chart that makes a heroic attempt to estimate the average numbers of minutes of different media content available to the average American for every minute the average American spent using media. 
over time. And you can see a development from a situation in the 60s and 70s where people had about 100 minutes of content to choose from, from every minute uh, of attention to a situation in the early 2000s where we are more like 900 minutes of attention for every minute, uh, minutes of content for every minute of attention. Now, the truly extraordinary thing about this chart is that the researchers behind it counted all of the internet as one option. So, of course, in practice, this goes towards infinity with the billions and billions of websites that all of us can choose from uh, when we go online. What does this mean um, for where we're heading with the business of news? It means that we had a media environment that was characterized by low choice for me, me as a user and consequent high market power for publishers. This is quite profitable for producers, less satisfying for users. Now we have a media environment that's characterized by high choice for media users and low market power for publishers. Uh, this is uh, frankly quite satisfying from the point of view of many users, but of course extremely difficult uh, for publishers to compete in. And in this highly competitive market, prices will, uh, in the absence of effective differentiation, approximate the marginal cost of serving one additional customer. This is a very basic insight in economics. And online, of course, that cost is near zero. So pay models will be hard because there'll always be an incentive for someone somewhere to make news available for free at the point of consumption, supported by advertising or other uh, forms um, of revenue. Of course, this is not the only challenge, as Victoria highlighted. Uh, you know, publishers primarily historically benefited from economies of scale and historically from bundling and high barriers to entry. Um, the economies of scale are still there, uh, but news have become unbundled. Uh, I don't need to buy the whole newspaper to get the sports or the weather um, or the TV listings. And the barriers to entries have gone down. Uh, in terms of launching a website, at least, there are no guarantees of actually getting any attention or making any money, but you can enter the market. And of course, now publishers compete with platforms for attention and for advertising. And the platform economy, as we see very clearly in market after market across the world, is a winner takes most market that's characterized not just by economies of scale that we understand well, but also by network effects and data network effects that makes it really, really difficult to compete head on with the most successful dominant players. Um, and judging from how they spend their time and money, even if publishers and journalists are often very discontent with this situation, audiences and advertisers mostly seem to like this. We need to remember that there are structural changes here and there are issues of market power and the like, but many of these developments are driven by the choices made by individual consumers and advertisers who, who it's not that they can't buy print newspapers or watch broadcast or pay us for our news online, it's that they choose not to. Now, what comes next, you might ask? Well, um, you'll miss us when we're gone is not a funding model. Uh, so that's not what comes next. Um, society needs us, while true is also not a funding model. Societies and people need lots of different things. And sadly, often they don't get it. Uh, we don't live in that kind of world, uh, sadly. So what are reality-based roads ahead? Well, ad-based models will become harder and less lucrative simply by virtue of the intense competition. But at scale and with low costs, uh, they will work for some publishers. Reader revenue-based models will require really effective differentiation in the quality product and will work for some, but it's clear, I think, that not all news is worth paying for given the abundance uh, of options uh, available. Journalism can also be a loss leader uh, where uh, publishers are not trying to monetize the journalism and the, and the con news content itself through advertising or reader revenues, but through other sources of revenue like e-commerce or selling services and consultancy around a reputation and a visibility built with their journalism. We see this with various newsletters, for example. Um, and of course, market failure, which is a very real risk, in particular at the local level, provides a basis for non-market models such as nonprofits or for that matter, public service or various forms of public subsidies. And where targeted, these can be highly effective um, and they will work for some, and I should hasten to add, in some places. It's not in every country around the world where we would want uh, philanthropists and politicians to get involved in funding media because, of course, their agenda may be quite different from that of, uh, of free journalism and independent news media. And that leads me really to sort of the last thing is to say, well, we need to be aware of oligarchs and politicians, which I don't need to remind people of um, from um, parts of Europe that are less sort of blessed by accidents of history than my own native Denmark. But it is worth remembering that, you know, with the many imperfections that for-profit publishing has and has had, it was part of what drove 
um, politics and proprietorial influence uh, out of the sort of the mainstream of the news media in some countries for a short period of time. And as that sort of business model wanes, uh, I think we have every reason to believe that um, oligarchs and politicians increasingly will engage in media capture and instrumentalization of news media that they run not to produce and provide independent journalism um, and impartial news, but to pursue their ideological or self-interested agendas of various sorts. I want to stress that this is a hard picture, but it's not doom and gloom. It's a reality-based view of where we are and where I think we're heading. Uh, it's tough. It will grow tougher for the business of news. But I would also stress that the best journalism we see today is some of the best that we have ever seen. And it's never been more important. And I will say that this can be done. We are continuing to see a structural decline of top line revenues for many, many companies and even the sector as a whole across the globe. And I expect that to continue for years to come because those revenues are largely based on the habits and preferences of older people who are literally dying and that business model will eventually die with them, mortality being the rule, even newspaper readers will eventually die. But we are also, I think, now in a different place for where we were five years ago in that we are now beginning to see, I think, the first true proofs of concept of distinctly digital, sustainable business models for different kinds of quality journalism. Um, and I'm going to ignore here the big American and UK based brands because they are so unusual and in that sense rarely instructive for, for what might work elsewhere and say simply that the very different forms of success that we see both from popular titles and upmarket titles with sort of newspaper legacies in, in, in some countries across Europe is very encouraging for the ability of at least some newspapers to reinvent themselves as digital news publishers. The success of digital born entrants like El Diario in Spain, uh, of course, Danik N, uh, who we're very glad to have with us here today, but also others, Malaysia Kini in Malaysia, uh, Setland in Denmark, Mediapart in France, um, and others is really encouraging. The Lincolnite in uh, the UK as a local news provider, we are beginning to see proof of concept of digital distinct forms of valuable journalism that are sustainable and thus can retain their independence and continue to do their important work even in this super, super hard environment. I think we should recognize that success and learn from it. And that's why I'm so delighted to be part of the conversation today where I hope we will do exactly that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasmussen. Um, a, bit, a bit encouraging and a bit not so encouraging presentation by seeing where we are heading. Uh, I also wanted to ask that, uh, from your present uh, this, um, report, there is, there is one graph which I think is very disturbing and it shows that trust in the news media continues to decline. And they were like given these numbers that less than half, 46% of people, respondents say that uh, trust, uh, they trust the news they are using and 32% uh, trust in search and 22% uh, trust in social. But in general, the trust in news media continues to decline. And uh, you tweeted this also on the Twitter uh, thread, and there was one tweet as a follow-up when someone wrote, this is good news. It means many people are opening their eyes and are skeptical of dishonest media outlets and personalities. Not everyone is being fooled. There were quite, quite many of these trolls uh, tweeting uh, as a response to your tweet. My, in short, my question, uh, do you see what we can do, how to regain trust to media, or is it still going down for the next couple of years? Um, I mean, our preliminary research and drawing on works of others suggest that there are sort of three sort of pretty central drivers of trust in the news. One is about people's perception of editorial practices. Do they think that the journalism is actually any good? And, and, and that is really quite finely differentiated and I think in ways that are quite sensible. You know, in the UK, people have very high trust in the BBC and very low trust in some of the popular titles and some of the sort of more frothy digital publishers. So people perceive and judge editorial quality and I think that's quite encouraging that they're quite discerning with that and trust some brands but not all brands. There are also two other factors I think are important. One is what I think of as sort of identity and the other one is politics. Identity is about whether people feel that they are represented reflected and respected uh, by news media. And I think it's clear that many communities don't feel that this is the case. And in a digital media environment, they, are, they have more and more opportunities to find one another and share their grievances online um, in ways that sometimes can come across as sort of journalism bashing that can be quite unappetizing. But also I think sometimes we need to recognize that some of it is quite legitimate. Um, you know, Different countries are different, but I, you know, I think it's worth recognizing, for example, that American journalism for a long time was journalism by white men 
for white men and about white men, then it shouldn't really surprise us that many people are not particularly um, content with that. Finally, there is politics. Um, it's clear that in country after country around the world, um, there is nothing short of a war against journalism being fought by politicians who have nothing but contempt for the idea of independent journalism and free news media, um, and who use it as a punching bag, um, uh, in part because they believe they won't fight back because of their commitment to impartiality, and politics being what it is. People who have sympathy for those politicians, whatever their merits uh, or, or demerits, will we'll often have a, a, a less positive view of, of journalism and news media than the public at large. We can see this in the United States very clearly. Um, people on the right in the US who may listen to President Trump and other politicians on the right who bash the media, they have much lower trust in the news than people on the left. We can also see it in a different inflection in the UK where uh, the former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn and many of his supporters were extremely critical of what they perceived to be conservative and pro-establishment news media and were very, very publicly critical of the news media and indeed on the UK, trust in, in news on the left is far lower than it is uh, on the right. So there are some things here that are about editorial practices. I think that's encouraging because these are things we can do something about and, and show people our work and where that work is trustworthy, odds are people may in fact trust it. But there are other issues too. Are we in fact as inclusive as we would like to say? And there are things that are beyond our control, which is the way in which media are becoming politicized and a sort of a political football that's being kicked around by powerful people who um, are not particularly interested in people who seek truth and report it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I wanted to remind to our viewers and listeners, you can also ask questions, so please use platform Slido and ask uh, by using this hashtag SSC Media. I have one more question. Uh, it's a topic also in Baltic countries now, uh, state support for commercial media, because especially we are small countries in small advertising market, and because a lot of ads money is going to huge international uh, Facebook and Google, these fake giants there is more and more uh, talks that we should have some state uh, support. Did you also investigate uh, during your uh, research this issue, how other smaller countries maybe are dealing and is it like growing trend to request the state support for commercial media? Um, I, I think there is a real changing in the sort of the mindset and thinking of journalists and news media in many countries around the world that historically were quite hostile to the idea uh, of, of of sort of political and public support, but are now reconsidering that as the clouds gather around inherited business models. Um, you know, whether that's attractive or not is uh, largely a political question and a, and a question for public support. Uh, it's for each of us as a citizen to decide whether we believe that some of our tax money should go to journalists. I personally believe that it is a sensible and appropriate solution provided that one is operating in a country and under a system where this is done in a way that guarantees the independence of the publishers in question. Uh, we can see this done in some of the Nordic countries uh, where uh, public service media are genuinely independent of government and of parliament. Um, and we can see it in um, also in terms of indirect and direct subsidies for private sector news publishers in a few of the Scandinavian countries, again, in a way where neither politicians, bureaucrats or anybody else gets to pass judgment on the quality of the journalism in question. If those conditions are not in place, um, then I am very fearful that what will be um, presented as public support for independent journalism, in fact, is a combination of incumbency protection propping up failing businesses and means for state capture where politicians um, increase their leverage uh, over news media and get new ways of trying to control um, how, how they are covered. So in countries where we can be somewhat confident that neither current nor possible future governments will misuse these arrangements in that way, I think this is a, a legitimate intervention, one I personally have some sympathy for as a citizen, as a taxpayer, uh, but it requires broad place political and public support and I would never um, recommend that in countries where there is a real risk that this will be used as a way to control media. I would rather have smaller and independent media than bigger and politically uh, captured media. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasmus, uh, for your presentation.